we actually have receptors in our skin that respond to like slow, gentle, comforting touches. Mm. So there's receptors in the skin, particularly in your hairy skin. So I'm stroking my arm, my forearm at the moment. <laughs> um, um, and actually they respond particularly to comforting forms of touch, uh, slow, gentle strokes. And what they do is they send signals to your brain and your brain responds to those signals a bit like it does to other rewarding stimuli. So how it might respond to food or sex or things like this. It, it finds social touch rewarding. Hi, my name is Anita Novak and I'm the author of this book. Welcome to season 12 of Purposeful Empathy, a show that is dedicated to amplifying the voices of people from across the globe who understand that the world needs more empathy and are doing something about it. Thanks for watching, enjoy the show. Welcome to a new episode of Purposeful Empathy. Today I am joined by Dr. Michael Bannesty, who is a professor and head of psychological science at the University of Bristol. He has worked as a neuroscientist for more than a decade and is an expert in social interactions and relationships, studying affection, communication, empathy, sleep, and touch. For his outstanding contributions to psychological research, Michael has received awards from the British Psychological Society and the European Society of Cognitive Psychology. His latest book explores how to enhance our levels of touch for a healthier and happier life. In the US, his book is called Touch Matters, handshakes, hugs, and the new science on how touch can enhance your well-being. And back home in the UK, it's called When We Touch. Welcome to the show, Michael. Hi, thanks very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here with you. I just discovered in the pre-call that you you were asked to write a book about empathy, but instead <laughs> you took a pass on that one to write the book about touch. And I'm happy because I'm the author on empathy. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and your book is a great book as well, by the way. I'm really enjoying it at the moment. Good. So thank you. Good. Well, I'm so excited to unpack this because I think there's so much to talk about. Um, first of all, the book is based on the touch test. Right, which I understand is the world's largest survey on touch with 40,000 participants from 112 countries. So I'm wondering if you could share sort of some of the broad, big takeaways and some of the surprises that you discovered from that test. Yeah, so so you're absolutely right. Yeah, 40,000 people, 112 different countries. And um, it looked at all different elements of touch in our lives, right? What does touch mean to people? How does it impact our health, well-being? Um but also things like how comfortable are we using various technologies to touch as maybe touch becomes more remote and, and digital. And I mean, one of the things that I found surprising about it, but maybe people don't find it as surprising as I did, was some of the commonalities that we saw. So often we think about touch as a sense that really is quite nuanced and can divide us. And it is true, there's a lot of nuance to touch, but but some of the very simple questions, like just asking people what does touch mean to them? And if they just give us three words, you know, you we saw pretty consistently around the world, um, didn't really matter what world region that we went to, that people were just saying comfort, warmth, love, affection, all these things. So although often we might these days think about touch with sometimes a bit of skepticism, sometimes a bit of nervousness at the heart of it, when you just ask people simply what does touch mean, they <laughs> they bring it back to that. And And what played out in the survey was that actually you know, people who have more positive attitudes towards touch and experience touch more often tend to have higher rates of things like well-being. Um, those who maybe feel more touch hungry, so people who feel they're not getting enough touch in their lives can show kind of connections to like lower, higher levels of loneliness and, and again, lower levels of well-being. Um, and a whole range of other things like how touch can have positive benefits on sleep. That was another major finding. And some of those individual differences that matter really came out. So often people think they're about culture as being a major factor. But what, what we found was there were there were broader differences linked to things like personality and attachment, which actually appeared to matter slightly more than some of those. Where do you, you know, where do you come from in the world kind of differences? So has all that research changed how you touch like do, are you more uh touchy feely now yeah it's really interesting so i i i kind of it's really hard i think to connect it to whether it's to the research or whether it was to covid because mm. this was a big thing in our research right so we launched the survey january 2020 um we developed it throughout 2019 and prepared it to launch in january 2020 we had no idea obviously like anybody that covid was coming um and so we ended up running the survey during during you know just before some of the pandemic restrictions and then just as they set in and that was quite interesting to look at those differences in our data um 
but it meant that I suppose it gave us quite an interesting window from the research, but also personally, I mean, for me, all of a sudden I was going through this interesting period where I was, I mean, I'm a touch scientist. I know touch was really important, um, but I suddenly found myself in a place where I was really missing touch from my own life, right? I was at the time living, you know, with my, with my partner and we were both in a kind of lockdown together. So I had somebody around to share physical contact with, but I still missed touch from friends, touch from family. Um, and I suppose, yeah, post the survey, post the research, but also post those pandemic restrictions, right? I've started to actually value those experiences more than I did before and try to pick up on them, you know, try to find ways to bring them into my life more often. So I kind of, it's difficult to disentangle that survey versus just living through COVID because I'm sure what I'm saying a lot of people would relate to, right? Whether you're a scientist or not. So um, yeah. So just out of curiosity, in, in Montreal, we have um, a very popular two-cheek kiss. And some people were saying yeah. that's going to go out the door along with the handshakes. But in the post-COVID world, we've gone back to it. But I imagine that there are still some people who wish that we didn't. Um, yeah. So what are you saying to people who are still a little bit reluctant to touch, who are having some anxiety around all of that, uh, that would sort of be a compelling case for no, really, it's worth it for your overall well-being to go for it yeah well I mean I think I think on that I mean I, I think we do have to respect that everyone does have different preferences and boundaries right and so I certainly don't want to be there saying to someone you know if you're really uncomfortable let's say hugging someone that you should start hugging them I, I don't think that's necessarily what my my message would be but I think my message would be to say, well, there are a lot of benefits that come from touch. You know, if you take something like hugging, there was a study, um, actually it was kind of based in the Pittsburgh area in the US. And they they basically measured how often do people hug for 14 days um, in a, over a kind of diary study. And then they brought people to the lab and they gave them a virus. They gave them the common cold. And then they looked at how did the symptoms developed and those people that had more hugs over those 14 days before being exposed to the virus were less likely to develop some of those symptoms so you know sometimes we might think of hugs as something that's nice to have but it can have these unusual kind of physical benefits to our to our health as well um and there's other ways touch can be really important as well we've mentioned loneliness it can impact things like you know our, our general stress levels so there's lots of benefits but of course if, if you're not someone that enjoys a hug from somebody else maybe there's other ways you could bring those benefits into your life and one way actually there are now studies looking at how just engaging in self-soothing touch so like hugging yourself can bring some of these benefits that can lower your stress levels that can make you feel um, more positive in different settings um, or maybe a diversity of other types of tactile experience, you know, so hand holding can carry benefits, massage can carry benefits. Um, it's not just all one type. That's one of the nice things about touches. You can get benefits from a diversity of ranges. And I suppose lastly, but by no means least, you know, we also should recognize there will be some times when people, even despite that, there's just no touch that's really, they feel comfortable with or that they like. And in that context, I think that is okay because you can still get benefits through sharing compassion and sharing care in other ways, right? So, you know, simple displays of affectionate support to you or to somebody else, whether that's writing them a note, um, whether that's giving them a hug, these things can be beneficial for you and the person you're giving them to. So there's other ways you can draw it in. It doesn't all have to be touched. So that's something we have to keep in mind. Now, okay, of course, that respects sort of personal boundaries for adults who understand their own, you know, uh, preferences. I wonder what you would say about children um, mm. and the importance of touch for well, babies. I know I've read that, you know, babies are healthier with the more touch they have, attachment uh, therapy, is it, yeah. or attachment theory. Um, I'm curious to hear what you have to say. There's a, there's a memory that's coming to mind of one of our prime ministers who I didn't have a fondness for shook his son's hand before the son went to school and it was you know like what you know so i'm just curious to know yeah, yeah so so again i mean touching in the early years is really important and it's actually right throughout our lives you know those kind of i suppose what we might think about as affectionate and caring forms of touch actually we respond to those right the way through until our 90s so although our discrimination of touch like our ability to detect fine differences in how something feels that might just decline as we age but affectionate comforting touch it's there right from birth right the way through to the very end and um yeah as you say in in very young infants it's been shown that particularly in premature infants actually so if they're born premature and they 
receive things like moderate pressure massage or kind of comforting forms of touch, they're more likely to gain more weight more quickly. Um, they're often more likely to leave hospital early, potentially as a consequence of that. Um, parents benefit too. There's work now showing that if you get parents to, or caregivers to engage in skin to skin contact with their infants early on, both mothers, fathers have been shown to have less anxiety, lower levels of depression and things like that. So it's a kind of reciprocal benefit that, could, that can certainly play out uh, and be there. So, so it's a very important cue um, from very early on and does shape relationships as we grow in different capacities. And I think your work is sort of part of a larger discourse. Like I understand that the UK uh, is the first country on the planet to have appointed a minister of loneliness a few years ago. And you mentioned loneliness earlier. We're living more and more alone by design, right? I think in the US is something like a third of households are, are single person dwellings at this point. Yeah. I'm just curious to know at, at a general meta level, um, you know, what you think besides touch, like the, the conversation around if we want to improve our personal well-being, that we actually need each other. And yeah. And, yeah. Yeah, 100 percent And actually, I mean, some of these things about why touch might help us is because it's a display of social connection and social support. And, and we know more and more now that yeah our our social bonds our social ties that we have with people are incredibly important to our health and well-being um i mean people have connected that to mortality rates people have connected that to loneliness as as you allude to and there's there's no denying i think in that sense that actually how we can i suppose build a sense of community and support around us mm. that can make the difference i mean the important thing in all of that is that it's really about I suppose, an individual's perceptions of what that social support looks like. Because for one person, social support might be, I need 50 people around me. Um, for another person, it might just be that one quality person, right? And so we have to keep that that in mind. And and I think this is something that increasingly there's greater awareness of. It's about that kind of quality. It's that for an individual. You can have hundreds of people around you and still be lonely. Yeah. Um and we've got to really think about that. And I think as a society, and as you alluded to, yeah, UK certainly has been doing quite a bit of work, but how can they try and build more, I suppose, community opportunities for people to get together um, and, and bring those links into their lives? Um, I think that awareness is growing. I mean, I think also it was the US Surgeon General, it was mm -hmm. around a month ago, just spoke about loneliness as a major issue there. So, so we are seeing that and it's a critical thing. And going back to touch, I mean, for me, I think touch is really important in that because and I kind of describe it this way a bit in the book, for me, touch is a bit like a social glue. It's it's mm -hmm. a sense that really does bring us together. Um, we actually have receptors in our skin that respond to like slow, gentle, comforting touches. Mm -hmm. So there's receptors in the skin, particularly in your hairy skin. So I'm stroking my arm, my forearm at the moment. <laughs> um, um, and actually they respond particularly to comforting forms of touch, that are slow, gentle strokes. And what they do is they send signals to your brain and your brain responds to those signals a bit like it does to other rewarding stimuli. So how it might respond to food or sex or things mm -hmm. like this. It, it finds social touch rewarding. And it also is thought to contribute to the release of hormones that can relax us, um, bring us to a state of rest, but also um, build bonds and build a sense of trust between us. And this is why touch can be such an important part of that process. You make me think of sort of um, even the psychedelics. I understand that there's a, a natural interest in just sort of like being in touch with each other, right? There's this idea that there, there's you just want to feel skin. Yeah, and yeah um, I guess the pleasure and reward centers of our brain are lighting up. Yeah, yeah. And there's, there's another component to that as well, which is actually we can also think about togetherness as also togetherness with the world around us, right? So touch is also another place where it's really important and, and can be really helpful is to ground us, to actually connect us to our environment in that moment. Um, and one of the things people often talk about is actually, for instance, touch in, if you don't have touch in your life, you know, you might find substitutes for it by doing things like gardening and stuff like this, because you're, you're physically touching and connecting and it's, it's bringing you in. And, and that actually is often connected back to things like mindfulness, um, mm. And often when we think about mindfulness, we people tend to connotate mindfulness with meditation, but of course it's not quite the same thing, right? Mindfulness is about that awareness of your body in that moment, being aware of the particular state around you. And when you really stop and think about it, touch is a really vital part of that. Um, and this 
links us a bit more back into technology as well, because now as we start to build, I don't know, virtual environments where we want people to feel present or mindful or within it, what people are realizing is to make that happen, you've got to get the haptics, you've got to get the tactile component right above and beyond things like vision and sound, because you know, when you're engaging in anything, even now sitting, talking to you on the phone, my feet are pressing on the floor, right? There's all these dynamics that are yeah. giving me feedback. And if that feedback suddenly disappears, it's amazing how much it can jar our perception of the world and what the world actually means to us. Yeah. So you're taking us in sort of like into the metaverse a little bit, sort of, you <laughs> know, uh, what are those glasses 3.0 where we're touching. Yeah, yeah. It makes me think of the, the book Brave New World, where you sat in movie theaters and you felt what was happening on the screen. That's yeah. kind of interesting. What are your, um, I don't know if you're, if you're spending any time thinking about this, but I'm concerned. There's a, a chapter that I write about technology. I'm concerned about sex, to be honest, with the idea of all the androids and robots that are coming yeah. to me that we're missing something in the human to human contact, you know, so do you have anything to say, any canary in the coal mine there? Yeah. I mean, I think it's a really interesting, interesting question. I think, I think sex is a good example. Um, I also think even other more, I suppose, well, I don't want to say everyday tactile interactions because I suppose sex can be an everyday activity as well. <laughs> um, but I, I mean, I think there's also now like an increasing look at how can you help people, I don't know, share things like kisses from a distance or how can you help them share a hug from a distance and stuff like this. And and actually, on the one hand, I think these are really interesting developments for people who maybe are in increasingly remote or distance relationships. I can see how being able to send someone a hug via a shirt or or send someone a kiss via an app, I can see how that could actually signal social support and have a benefit. But at the same time, will it have that same benefit as the physical experience? Right. That's something we just don't know. There's no real data on that. No one's done that that comparison. And given that, you know, when we talk about touch and we talk about that idea that we have receptors that respond and release those hormones where we physically have somebody touching us, it's kind of slightly harder to see that playing out fully. Like, is that really fully going to be captured by the tech? And that's something that we're now looking at in our own research. We're trying to do comparisons between what if you're getting a remote hug versus an actual physical hug? Does it carry similar benefits? And at the moment, we don't have any data in to, to tell people what that looks like, but I think that's that's part of the journey for us. Right, and part of me is hoping that it will not mean the same thing. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> well, well, one of the things that, I mean, I speak about this a bit in, in the book as well, was like, I mean, one of the things that I find really relaxes me is uh, I have a pet dog, right? And so often just the dog sitting by my feet or stroking the dog, right? It's relaxing. And and there's data to support that. You know, you get kind of things like cortisol changes and things like that, um, hormones evolved in stress, for instance, that, that change. Um, but what's intriguing is now people are comparing what happens if you stroke a real live dog versus if you stroke a robotic dog or, uh, you know, those kind of social companion robots. And remarkably you get really similar effects with the robots <laughs> um, and I, I was I, I was I'm a bit miffed about that like and I don't know if it's just because I have a pet dog and I'm like come on I want to be on his side but it's an interesting thing to think about how's that going to play out and again there's applications right you've got elder care homes where people who are yeah. suffering from dementia Alzheimer's robots chatting with them I could imagine robot dogs being pet that there is some benefit yeah. I just wonder you know uh, where's where's that point when does it go too far right hey there I don't mean to interrupt a fabulous fabulous conversation. I just want to draw your attention to the fact that there are so many other great conversations on my YouTube channel, over 120 episodes with already 25,000 views, completely organic. Thanks to you, my listeners, viewers, watchers, please subscribe. The world needs more empathy and you have a role to play. I want to ask you a last question about touch before we get into empathy, because you there's a lot of things to talk about when it comes to empathy and your research as well. So one of the things I do in my class is eye gazing, and I do it in my workshops as well, where people pair up and for 30 seconds, they do a simple eye gaze. The only rule is no talking and no staring competition. And it's very awkward and people find it very, you know, and then after the 30 seconds, they shake off some energy and then we go for 90 seconds. And I kind of yeah. talk them through it a little bit. I'm curious to know as a last question, how much 10 X it you would be if I invited people to not only look into each other's eyes, but to actually hold hands as they do it. Yeah. Really interesting. And interesting. You chose hold hands rather than let's say, I don't know, hug. I mean, it's hard to look into someone's eyes when you hug. Right. But, um, 
The short answer is I don't know. I, I really don't. I really don't know the answer because there's, there's less research on that kind of work. I mean, we do know that if, for instance, you get people to hug for a very short time, if it's too short, that's normally a problem for them. But there's also that scenario where if it's too long, right, <laughs> like, it's like, let go of me now. <laughs> um, and I imagine also a really important part of it would be the emotional bonds between the people. So we know in general that we're more open to to engaging in these kind of tactile behaviors and where people will be allowed to touch, for instance, if we have stronger bonds with them. So I think there's a whole range of dynamics that would probably play out. But yeah, I'm trying to picture it myself because I've actually done that the exercise of eye gaze that you've talked about. I, I've I've been I've been a recipient in that, you know, where I've, I've done that exercise before. And and you're right, as it goes on to 90 seconds, it's like, wow, okay, this is getting a little bit more challenging. And I imagine there's kind of part of me that thinks touch might settle it to it in a strange way, but there's also part of me that thinks there's going to also be a sweet spot in that where it goes on just probably a bit too long as well. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that a hug that's too short also rubs us the wrong way. Because that's the thing, right? There's there's normally a sweet spot in that where, so I think if you, yeah, it's not, it's not quite linear, right? It's a kind of nice kind of inverted yeah. U as it were. Um, <laughs> Super. Okay. So let's talk empathy for a few minutes. Um, how do we experience empathy, Michael? Yeah, so I mean, empathy, I think it's one of these things that we all probably think we experience day to day, but it's it's made up of so many different components, right? And I suppose in my realm, um, as a kind of social neuroscientist, psychologist that studies this, we kind of think about it as obviously there's there's different components. There's there's the component of, I suppose, identifying the emotion that the person is in the particular state and being able to say, well, they're in that state and I'm not in that state and actually starting to then share their state. So, you know, that kind of ability of sharing what they're, they're feeling. And often this is connected to brain regions that are involved. I suppose uh, you tend to, we tend to recruit similar brain regions as when we experience that state ourselves. Um, but then, of course, there's always a risk in that. If we're literally sharing what someone is feeling, that we can begin to potentially become overwhelmed by that. It might be distressing for us. And, and I think this is one of the things of empathy, that there's always that risk that if we become too distressed by it, rather than empathy lead to some of those nice benefits that it can bring, like, I don't know, compassionate behaviors and, and caring behaviors, it might make us want to withdraw. It might mm -hmm. make us overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. And so... It's not only about sharing what someone's feeling, but it's also about being able to regulate that, right? It's being able to switch our focus between the self and somebody else and actually say, right, I'm going to stop focusing on you now and actually focus a bit more on me or, or yeah. focus on a different component, or I'm going to find an outlet so that that experience where I'm sharing doesn't become overwhelming. Maybe I'm going to think about how you can help yourself here so I can find those outlets mm. to start helping you in that journey. Um, and this kind of seesawing, I suppose, between the self and other seems to be a really vital part of empathy, at least in our research that we've done. And I think developing that skill, like you said, to, to regulate is so important because uh, people who are in the healing professions, nurses, for example, or psychologists, yeah. have mechanisms where they, you know, they know that they're they're, they're turning up their dial on empathy for their work, but then they also yeah. have to recharge their batteries. But in day-to-day, -day, you know, interactions in the workplace or in the home life, we also need to find that middle ground where we are taking care of ourselves, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. And I think that is that is the thing. It's about trying to strike that balance, right? And I think balance is increasingly becoming the key word when we, when we think about empathy. I mean, I think if you go back, well probably a decade or so ago I think everyone was talking lots about the the positives mm -hmm. um and then I think people started there were a few people like Paul Bloom talking about some of those mm -hmm. those negative components of empathy um and I kind of think now actually things are circling a bit more back to balance right and I think we're, we're probably both you know preaching to the converted to a degree <laughs> in, that, in that sense for this idea of a more kind of motivated or purposeful approach to empathy where actually you know you can you can use it in certain ways, but also think about, well, how can I regulate and get that balance in across all walks of life and make sure that, yeah, my empathy in the workplace doesn't cross over to how I'm feeling at home and so forth and trying to get that balance across the piece. And and sort of if we talk about, um, I don't know if it's called social empathy, but in, in the space, in the context of working with people, collaborating, let's say a team at work, you know, um, what's the value of empathy in those spaces? Yeah, I mean, it's it's really quite 
broad. I mean, you you see things like increased collaboration um, as a starting point. You know, I think um, you can see things where different team members might feel more comfortable sharing their ideas and, and their concerns and their, I suppose, their feedback, right? Because they can kind of see that actually it's encouraging sharing. It's encouraging kind of collective problem solving. Um, there's other areas as well, right? I mean, just things like communication from the team. Um you know, I think there's a lot of work over the years that's shown that in general, um, when people engage in aspects of empathy, um, I mean, this can allow for things like active listening, the ability to kind of, I suppose, clearly communicate and maybe reduce misunderstandings. Um, and I suppose another big part is also to do with relationships, right? It, it, empathy is connected to building and maintaining relationships. And that's not just in a positive sense, but it's also in those negative scenarios, right? Where maybe there's a conflict in a relationship and empathy can play a role in helping to resolve that conflict because, you know, you can, you can kind of try to approach the situation and trying to understand the different perspectives that you're dealing with. Mm. Another um, piece of the empathy uh sort of conversation I'm curious in uh, hearing your thoughts about is, is there are limits to our capacity to empathize, right? So if we're overwhelmed or we're stressed, that's an inhibitor, but also just the idea of, um, you know, and this is, I think, based on our early brain development, that we don't empathize with people who are unlike us to the same extent as people who are like us. So I'm just curious to know what your thoughts on are, how to overcome sort of these implicit biases that we have that may have served us a long time ago but now sort of like you know put barriers yeah yeah it's, it's really challenging right and it's also it's an interesting dialogue as well because i think um i suppose there's different dynamics that i mean it's absolutely right people can show biases and their empathy towards people if from their in group rather than from their out group but then on the other side if you get scenarios where i don't know if an outgroup member expresses empathy towards an in-group member, then you can see in those types of scenarios that in-group members can start to be more likely to humanize an outgroup in a conflict situation. So there's ways empathy can mm. have a positive spin as well in that context. And and I think um and you mentioned about capacity issues. And again, I think you know people allude to there that I suppose when we think about empathy under a capacity issue, sometimes that might lead to people to say, well, my capacity is at full, so I'm just not going to bother. Um, oh, and there's there's a dynamic in that. So there's all these 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 nuances. But I I think you're absolutely right. It's 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 a real challenging and thorny issue just to unpack how can we best support empathy. And I think some of that is really, I suppose, about I think it's important to make people aware of the fact that, you know, empathy is a skill that can be trained and can be regulated. And so although yes, there are capacity components to empathy, we can choose to work with that and we can also think about i suppose certain I suppose it's kind of top level um context that can influence our empathy and i think we can just try and raise awareness of that and think about how that can play out i mean and different places do that differently i mean there's there's for instance work showing if you reward empathy you see more of it for example mm -hmm. and i'm not necessarily sure that's always the best way to go but there's these different dynamics that can probably feed in as well yeah, and uh, Stanford professor Jamil Zaki talks even yeah. just having the belief that we can become more empathic changes our behavior. So are there any training um, programs or training uh, ideas that you think are useful for us to flex our empathy muscles? Yeah, well, I mean, there's very simple things. I think um, just framing is really important. So the kind of instructions or framing that you can give to a situation um, and this can be really simple, a uh, simple instruction of instructing people whether to feel what somebody is feeling or telling them to, I suppose, kind of feel more positively and warm towards the person without actually literally feeling what they're feeling. It's a very subtle distinction between empathy and compassion. Um, mm -hmm. That kind of thing can have a big impact. So you see when you get that more compassion framing, mm -hmm. having that kind of component of warmth and outlet to it rather than just feel what the person's feeling you can see more of empathy being maintained through. Um, we've done work ourselves about just regulating or training people's ability to switch their focus between the self and somebody else. So we get people just to do this mm -hmm. offline for, for, let's say, 30 minutes or so. And we actually see that provides benefits to people's empathy even 24 hours later. So in a short-term hit, you can train components of those skills. 
Um, and there is, of course, work as well around things like meditation and, and different meditation techniques. That again, a lot of those do think about well, it's how you're framing things, how you're bringing in things like kind of compassion meditation, loving kindness meditation. Um, so I think these different dynamics can probably play different roles. Um, and I, um, yeah, also kind of do take that point, which, as you say, so Jamil Zaki has made before, right? That just getting people aware that actually empathy can be a choice and there are ways you can do it can just give you, I guess, is that sense of autonomy and control over the process. And if you can then give people skills and tools, um, and keep in mind those skills and tools can also sometimes be, I suppose, even more everyday type activities, like just explaining to people how being careful how you regulate your sleep will obviously have a big impact on your capacity to regulate your interpersonal emotions to somebody the following day. And all of these kind of dynamics, which all place empathy a bit more under our control of thinking, well, okay, that's something I can think about there in that space, or I'm going to make sure I take the time for myself just to actually offset at the end of the day and maybe that's i want to write my thoughts down on paper maybe that's i want to go for a run maybe that's whatever that looks like for you but actually saying that's an okay perfectly healthy suitable way to say you know i've been a bit overwhelmed by this and i'm letting an outlet out so i can then regulate my empathy all these kind of things i think yeah. give people a bit of a toolkit that comes together emotional hygiene in general yeah yeah. yeah beautiful word for it <laughs> Well, Michael, I want to ask one final question. It's the last question of every podcast that I ask my guests. If you can think of a time in your life when you were on a receiving end of empathy and what that meant for you. Yeah, I mean, um, gosh, there's, there's so many that, that come to mind, actually. <laughs> actually, but I think um, I think particularly, I mean, I, I'll, I think probably I'll, I'll go back to pandemic components for me and actually that that component of you know i guess like like lots of people you know we we sadly lost people during the pandemic but we weren't able to actually be with each other at the end of that and actually just still having the empathy and the support of friends and family around you who could send those kind of compassionate messages and those caring messages i mean those were lasting things to carry you you through in a particularly challenging time right and and that even though that was remote and I do worry sometimes about whether we can really have those same levels of social connection and empathy and support remotely. It just is something that I think it was for me, at least a very personally powerful experience that, that carried forward. Mm. Well, it sounds like you lost somebody uh, special and I'm so sorry for that yeah. loss. Uh, um, but I'm glad you were surrounded by people who did reach out. Exactly. To you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. For sure. And that's yeah. a choice that people make, which is why I always put the emphasis on the purposeful empathy that we can choose to be more empathic. And exactly, uh, right? if we do, the benefits go both ways, you know, to the person on the yeah. receiving end. But then also, as you've talked about through all the touch research you've done, there are a lot of healthy benefits that we accrue. Yeah, absolutely. And I and I think that is the thing. I mean, in general. It's well known that sharing affection and social support to others, whether that's touch, whether that's empathy, compassionate behaviors, mm -hmm. these things often giving them carry very similar benefits to our physical and mental health as receiving them. And I think that's uh, something we can very helpful to be aware of because, you know, especially when we talk about empathy at a capacity or something that might tire us, but the fact that actually giving empathy, you know, being compassionate can bring those benefits. Exactly. Is a sign why we might want to think about it too. Well, thank you for all the work that you do. It's been a lovely conversation. I'm so grateful that for the time that you made um, to, to share with us, the community here. Thanks, Michael. And thank you all for watching and listening. We'll see you next week. Thank you so much for watching an episode of Purposeful Empathy. If you enjoyed this conversation, subscribe to the channel and also consider picking up your copy of Purposeful Empathy. It's an invitation to dial up empathy in your life. The world needs more empathy. We need more empathy. What are you waiting for?